Jai Radham Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Jai Radham Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Gopi Janavalava Kiri Vardhari Gopi Jai Gopi Janavalava Kiri Vardhari Suranandana Rajadhyana Hanjahaya Jasuranandana Rajadhyana Hanjahaya Jamunatira Havana Chahadiya Jamun Tira Havad Chahadiyamu Jayuradham Bhagavan Kunjabi Hadir Jai Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai Gaur Pimanande
So we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 8, Chapter 12. And this is Mohini Murti bewilders Lord Shiva, verse number 41. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Sri Sukha Uvacha Evam Bhagavata Raja Sri Vat Sankena Satkritaha Amantriya Tampari Kramya Sangana Shwalayam Yayo Sri Sukha Uvacha Evam Bhagavata Rajam Sri Vatsan Kena Satkritaha Amantreya Tam Aparikramya Sangana Shwalayam Yayo Chetam Anyone else? Ladies? <laughs> Sri Sukha Uvacha, <clears throat> Sri Sukha Dev Goswami said, Evam, thus, Bhagavata, by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Rajan, O King, Shivatsa Akena, one who carries the mark of Srivatsa, on his breast. Satkrita, being much, being, being very much applauded. Amantriya, taking permission from Tam, him, Parikramya, circumambulating, Sagana, with his associates, Swa'alayam, to his own abode, Yayo, went back, <clears throat> it's translation. Sukadev Goswami said, O King, having thus been praised by the Supreme Personality of God, who bears the mark of Srivatsa on his chest, Lord Shiva circumambulated him. Then, after taking permission from him, Lord Shiva returned to his abode, Kailash, 
along with his associates. Purport. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur remarks that when Lord Shiva was offering obeisances to Lord Vishnu, Lord Vishnu arose and embraced him. Therefore the word Srivatsakena, Sankena, is used here. The mark of Srivatsa adores the chest of the Lord Shiva, uh, Lord Vishnu, I'm <laughs> sorry. And therefore when Lord Vishnu embraced Lord Shiva, while being circumambulated, the Srivatsa mark touched Lord Shiva's bosom. Om Gyanti Miranda Syad Ganajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurvena Mahanama Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani Namaste Sir Sari Devi Gaudavani Pachari Nani Vasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya de Satari ne vancha kalpa de rubis cha, kripa sindu pe vacha, pitanam pavane bio, vaishnave bio, na mahona maha, jaisi krishna, chaitanya, prabhu nityananda, sri adwaita, gadada rasiva, siddhi gor, bhakta vrinda, hari krishna, hari krishna, krishna krishna, hari hari. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So Sukadeva Goswami speaking to King Parikshit, summing up this particular pastime. And he wants to make this one point, which was just to show how merciful the Lord is. The Srivat's mark is actually a, some say a white hair, some say a golden hair on the chest of the Lord. But it indicates uh, Lakshmi, <laughs> the goddess of fortune, who sits on the chest of the Lord. The Srivat's mark is unique only to the Supreme Lord, Vishnu. And even Krishna has it. So this uh, mark distinguishes uh, Vishnu from many of his associates because one of the uh, opulences and one of the uh, uh, forms of liberation is called surupya liberation, meaning get the, one gets the same form as the Lord. So when he gets the same form as the Lord, how can you tell who's the Lord and who's not the Lord? <laughs> well, the Srivats mark is the indication only the Lord has that mark, the Srivats, and he carries what is called the Kastuba gem on his chest he wears. So these two distinguishing marks are unique from for the Lord himself. So you see, this mark is very special, and therefore, when he embraced, just to show his gratitude to Lord Shiva, for being so humble, although he was defeated, and at the same time being very happy that he had such a wonderful master as Lord Vishnu, uh, the Lord embraced him, and then, of course, that mark touched the body of Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva was sufficiently blessed by that. And so his, this blessing upon Lord Shiva was the final uh, interchange between these two. The Lord left him with this nice blessing. The Lord is very kind. And this is one thing we can learn as we practice devotional service, how kind the Lord is. It's not easy to practice devotional service, and it's very difficult to please the Lord, at least in many aspects of it. Difficulty in the sense that it the Lord is very pure, and we are unpure. <laughs> and therefore, to try to pure, please Him, because He doesn't need anything. And if our prayers are like a like a child speaking broken language, you know, the father says, "Oh, you speak so nicely," and the child's going, "Oh yeah, 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 you, yeah, 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 yeah." Nobody understands what he says, and he doesn't know what he's talking about either. So, you know, but the father thinks, oh, such beautiful poetry coming from the Vedas, you know. 
it's the hymns of the Samaveda coming from the mouth of my child. <laughs> so Krishna's like that. He uh, He's very kind. Although we can't offer prayers properly, nor can we offer him anything he needs, still he accepts because he's very kind and very merciful. <laughs> so one of the things we learn how as we go on in devotional service, that Krishna is so kind. <laughs> if it wasn't for his kindness, I wouldn't be in devotional service. If it wasn't for his kindness, I wouldn't be in uh, association of the devotees. <laughs> and that's a fact. It's not just some nice way to appreciate the Lord. It is a fact. He's very magnanimous, and he, he makes so many concessions so we can engage in devotional service. Here we're hearing how he's just so, you know, pleased with Lord Shiva that he simply, you know, embraces him and then that embrace becomes a great source of happiness for Lord Shiva. Today is also Ekadasi, and it's the, uh, what's the name of the Ekadasi? I'm not sure. Parshva. Hmm? Parshva Ekadasi. P-A-R-S-H-V-A. Parshva. Parshva Ekadasi. Well, the Ekadasis usually have two names, so there must be another name, too. Hmm? It is the Ekadasi that we celebrate and honor um, the Lord who spoke the Bhagavad Gita on the battlefield of Kurutrecha, which is the most clear description of the process of devotional service given by the Lord. Clear, direct. What is it called? Oh yeah, moksha, yeah, moksha, yeah. Moksha and mokshadi, yeah. Moksha di, right? Moksha da. Hmm? Moksha da. Moksha da, yeah, moksha da. Yeah. Who knows what the word da means? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> to give, yeah. Or, yeah, sometimes it means best to to give, yeah. Yeah, just like we, we say, Madurjvala Prema Dya Sri Rupa Nuga Bhakti Da. And when we glorify Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he is the giver, he is the best giver of Bhakti, Bhakti Da. Hmm. So, um, yeah, today is uh, an opportunity to uh, go deeper into the knowledge given to us by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, which is foundational for our advancement in devotional service. Bhagavad Gita mm, has 700 verses. Some people say 745, but that's wrong. It's 700 verses spoken by the Lord in order to convince his pure devotee who has apparently come under illusion that it's his duty to fight against his family members. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Proposal. See, this is a very important point. Uh, another particular message could have been just like Krishna could have been in, sitting in the kitchen and saying to his senior cook, uh, you know, you have to make halibut today. And the cook is saying, no, I want to make, you know, kachoris. And so why wasn't that the scene or some other thing the scene for the, for the speaking of the Bhagavad Gita? Because to emphasize the most difficult thing 
and make and then give the highest teachings to apply to the most difficult material situation. He has to fight against those he loves and kill them. <laughs> That's his duty. <laughs> And he, he doesn't want to do his duty. So you see, there's a difficulty here. So Krishna, and Krishna could have spoke to Bhagavad Gita in any other setting, but he chose this one because it helps us to understand that no matter how difficult our duty is, we still have to do it. <laughs> because our duty is aligned with our our nature, and our nature is to serve the Supreme Lord. So therefore, choosing the most difficult material situation in order to speak the highest philosophical teachings to a person who doesn't want to really change or doesn't want to listen to anything but his own ideas for what he should be doing, Krishna chose this particular situation to help us all. We are all on the battlefield of life. This, will, this, this is to take up Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada said. It's a declaring war on Maya. <laughs> declaring war on Maya. So he said it's a fight. So those who don't want to fight, you can't make any advancement. Or you can't even stay in Krishna consciousness. What are you fighting? You're fighting against those desires that have been with you for so many millions of lifetimes. The desires, and the, the, the two main desires that we have to fight against are the desire to control, the desire to enjoy. The, the you know, controller and enjoyer are exclusively for Krishna. Well, he's the supreme enjoyer, supreme controller. Bhoktaram, yagya, tapasan, sarvaloka, maheshiram, suidam, sarabhutanam, shantamam, yantam, richtati. Krishna explains that I am the proprietor and I am also bhokta. Bhokta means enjoyer. So we come to the material world because we want to enjoy separate from Krishna. And therefore, in order to do that, we have to be in control. So you see in this material world, everyone is vying for the position of being the controller or the enjoyer, both. Why? Because if I can, if I can control, then I can enjoy. But if I don't have control, how am I going to enjoy? Hmm. So, but this is this is Maya, this is illusion, this is the living entity's consciousness when in contact with the material energy. If we take shelter of Krishna in devotional service and serve him, that's enjoying. And we can control how we, we are, execute our devotional service. That much we have. And by using those things in devotional service, they become purified. When they become purified, then the soul is elevating itself closer and closer to perfection, uh, pure devotional service. So that is the, uh, the ultimate goal, to give up this idea of being the controller, being the enjoyer. Simply becoming the servant is our position. Shiva, he uh, realizes his position now. Although he is one of the principal expansions of Lord Vishnu, he, take, he understands that no matter how great I am, and he has a lot of power, not only that, he has a lot of followers too. <laughs> millions and millions of followers. Shiva is one of the most prominent, important, and probably is yes, the most powerful outside of Krishna or Vishnu. He's very powerful. But he becomes humbled in relationship to Krishna. He becomes proud that he has such a master as such the Supreme Lord who can bewilder even him. So um, this is one of the qualities of a devotee, a devotee is always in looking to be in a subordinate position. 
subordinate in the sense that uh, we want to be able to get rid of this desire to enjoy and separately from Krishna. There's no such thing as separate enjoyment, but it appears to be like that. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, <clears throat> let me see. Yeyatam mam prapadyante tam stataiva bhajami aham mama bartmanam bartante manusha parta sarvasyaha. All, everyone is within my energies. No one can escape from my energies. In other words, everyone is approaching me directly by devotional service, indirectly by trying to serve my material energy. Both are connected with to Krishna. So therefore no one can get away from Krishna. You can, just like Prabhupada would use the example, in the society the government has laws and rules to follow. The citizens who follow them, they become rules, they become, they become good citizens and they get the benefit of the state. But then there is another class of people who don't, who want to rebel against the state and break the law, so they're put in jail. And they have to work for the state in a very difficult situation, a, a situation of punishment. But still, they're connected to the state because the state connects to the prison, is, creates the prison house. So the material world is like a prison house. And uh, if we're not serving Krishna, we're serving in the prison, that's all. There's no, because his energies are complete, either it's direct devotional service or the material energy, which is the locking. Um, everyone tries to be free here, but no one is free. I remember I was, one time I was driving on the highway, mm. And then uh, I was in one, uh, yeah, and the roads were quite busy. This was in Washington, D.C., in America. And then there was one car, he was driving in and out of the traffic really fast, going from one lane to another, trying to pass everybody up. And uh, I was thinking, boy, he's driving crazy, you know. But then I, I managed to get a little close to his car, and I saw that on the, his license plate, because in America you can get a special license plate and you can have your name put on the license plate if you pay extra money. I remember I did that also. I put Rama on my license plate. So I had R-A-M-A. -A. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I had this one devotee, I know he has Krishna on his license plate. And people have, you know, Govinda and so many other things. So this this boy and this person who was driving this car, and I saw it was a young boy. He was driving in and out of traffic real fast, and it was looked like he was creating danger. But then when I saw his license plate and I read the back, it said, "I'm free. I'm free." <laughs> and I thought, "Where's your freedom? You're going to crash any minute." <laughs> You have no freedom. You're in the illusion you're free. To do anything you want to do and call that freedom is foolishness. Jai Panchatattva Ki Jai. I'm free. I can do anything I want. No, you can't. Because there's laws that are working. And if they're the laws of the state don't catch you for your misactivity, the laws of God or the laws of material nature will catch you. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> so you can't escape. You can escape, Prabhupada said, you can escape the laws of the state, but you can't escape the laws of God. Because God is in the heart of all living entity and he knows exactly what you're doing. And material energy is there just to carry out his order of punishing the living entities who do not want to serve the Lord. 
So no one's free. And even we might even say, well, is a devotee engaged in devotional service? Is he free? We can say yes and no. <laughs> yes, in the sense that because he's on the spiritual platform, he's free from the material energy. And the spiritual platform allows one for, for great amounts of expression of one's nature. But at the same time, he's still within a particular energy called the spiritual energy. It's called antur, and it's called uh, antarangya sakti shakti. There's three energies: antarangya sakti shakti, and that is the spiritual energy. Then you have bahirangya shakti, that's the material energy, and then you have a third energy called tatasta shakti. Tatasta shakti is us. We are marginal. It's called marginal energy. You can choose which way you want to go. You want to go to the spiritual or you want to go to the material. Therefore, these two energies, Bahiranga and Aktaranga, are always side by side. And you have a choice whether you want to serve the Lord or you want to serve your own mind and senses, <laughs> which is serving the material energy. And so that choice always remains. And so sometimes people ask, well, why does God give us a choice? Why don't he just force us to become his devotee? He is. <laughs> he, he creates the material energy to do that. If you break the laws or you serve the material energy, then you're going to get a reaction from the material energy. And if you... And he also forces us by coming in the form of his deity so we could worship him, in the form of Bhagavatam so we can learn about him, in the form of the holy name so we can associate with him through transcendental sound, and through the form of prasadam so we can find a very happy and very easy way to get his association. So these are all ways he's forcing us in that way. But some people think, well, maybe he should just become even more forceful. Like, you know, we want to do something and he comes in and he stops us from doing it. No, he won't do that. He gives you your freedom. Because there's two reasons why he gives you your freedom. One is because you have the same nature as God. And God is, is fully swarat. Swarat means independent or free. And we also have that nature because we're part of him. And so that means we are partially free, not completely. And the other thing is that in order to develop a relationship with Krishna in a, in a genuine way, it has to be voluntary. It cannot be forced. No one, God does not force anyone. But he forces us, as I say, through the material energy by punishing us and by coming in a very wonderful way in, the, in, his, in his different aspects of devotional service. That's his forcefulness. Like that. Uh, so, yeah, but still, there's that independence to choose Krishna or not. And if we choose Krishna, we have to suffer. I mean, we have to, uh, if we choose Maya, we have to suffer. If we choose Krishna, we're free from suffering like that. Okay, so, and today, as we mentioned, is the Bhagavad Gita uh, dissertation, uh, glorification, uh, speaking the Bhagavad Gita, and... Um, The knowledge of Gita, as we mentioned earlier, is uh, created in the mind of Arjuna. He completely changed. After hearing from Krishna, transcendental knowledge, he didn't want to fight, and he had so many good reasons. Prabhupada says he had good reasons to fight. They weren't just his selfish reasons. They were selfless reasons for the benefit of others. But... Krishna didn't want to hear any other thing, any reason. 
So those reasons were material because they were based on something temporary. As Krishna told Arjuna when he first began to speak to him, the knowledge of Gita, he said, Asochan of Asochan's twelve pratyavari of Avasase, Katasums gata gatumsa cha, nanu shochan dipanditaha. You're a, a pundit, you're not a pundit. A pundit is one who knows, one who's learned, he's a, he's a scholar. A pundit is one is the opposite, who one who uh, thinks he knows but doesn't know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. So our, our Juna is being criticized in the very beginning for being a pundit, one who doesn't know, although he's a very learned man. So Krishna doesn't cha- doesn't say, "Well, you're you know you whatever you say is nice." <laughs> he said, "You're speaking learned words, but you I'm saying you're a fool." Because you don't know what is truth. You think maintaining the body is actually the goal of life. Krishna told Arjuna, I have killed all of these persons here. You simply become my instrument, that's all. Okay, so we'll stop here and see if there's any questions or comments. Thank you, Maharaj, for the class. Um, People say, how can God encourage someone to do violence? Arjuna was encouraged to fight the battle because Krishna wanted the Kauravas to be killed. But when we are faced with this question, how can we explain to people that God incited violence? You can't. They won't understand. <laughs> Violence is a part of life. You can't stop it. But there is righteous violence. That is called Kshatriya. Kshatriya. Shat means to protect. Triya means from harm. There are people who want to harm others, and there's a class of people that are designated to to stop people from harming others. We call them soldiers, we call them policemen, we call them, you know, security guards. In other words, protecting others is part of life. And that kind of violence that is necessary to do that is righteous. So that's why Krishna wanted to protect the Pandavas who were the rightful heirs from the throne to be, from being killed at the same time being pushed out of their position. And knowing that if, if Duryodhana and his family got the throne, then the world would suffer. So Krishna could foresee that he wanted to establish saintly rule. And Yudhisthira was the qualified person. Uh, those who are, just like there's, a, there's a, a story, I think it was one very famous uh, person who was in, he was a sadhu, very peaceful person. And um, he has made he made a public declaration that I I will never act violent in any circumstance. So he was a family man also. So one reporter came up to him, and he the reporter knew that he had a daughter. So um, he said to the sadhu. Uh, if someone comes to violate or vilify or harm your daughter, what would you, would you try to stop them? What would you do? He said, he answered in a very indirect way, he said, 
Under no circumstances will I become violent. So in the second, so the reporter repeated that. And then again, he repeated the same answer. And then finally the reporter said, my dear sir, you are violent. <laughs> because you fail to protect those who need protection. Hmm. And there's a class of people that do that, and they're called Kshatriyas. Like that. Prabhupada was aghast when he came to New York because sometimes people would be, you know, uh, killed on the streets just in public and no one would come to help them. Prabhupada said, when somebody's trying to harm someone and you're there, you should try to protect them or do something. He said, that is human nature. And Prabhupada was shocked to see that nobody was doing that. People didn't want to be implicated in this situation, that's why. Hmm. So, yeah, to give protection to others, especially innocents, and there's five, people, there's five classes of people who require protection. That is, the brahmanas, the cows, women, old people, and children. That's a verse from the Bhagavatam. These five require protection. And a society that fails to protect them is a, uh, is a, is a deficient, defunct, useless society. You have to give protection to these five types of people who, who require protection. They require protection. So a class of men, uh, Kshatriyas, are there. They should be trained. Mm -hmm. Just like in our temples, if someone comes in our temple to do something, some harm to some ladies or maybe to accost the children or something, there should be someone there to stop them like that. And Prabhupada said, it's up to the leaders in the temple to have to be ready to fight if someone comes to attack our temple. Mm -hmm. We don't say, oh, we're nonviolent. Just come and take everything you want. Like that, no. <laughs> no, violence or not violence, but it's more like uh, protection that sometimes looks like violence. And this is what's going on here in this particular. Krishna tried everything to avert the battle of Kurukshetra. He, he even went to Duryodhana himself and asked Duryodhana just to give the Pandavas, you know, five villages, so they, because they're Kshatriyas, they can rule. Duryodhana was so greedy, he said, I won't even give him enough land to put a head of a pin on. <laughs> so, and then Duryodhana became angry with Krishna and he called his soldiers to uh, arrest Krishna. When Krishna showed his universal form, the Duryodhana and the soldiers, and they all fell back <laughs> and Krishna won't left. Duryodhana saw the universal form, but still he was against Krishna. <laughs> That's how lusty and greedy he was. So it's not like <laughs> the battle was the first choice, the battle was the last choice. Mm. So when there was no other recourse, then war was the, the only left. <clears throat> and that was, that's why Prabhupada said it was a righteous war. It was fought for religious principles, not fought for for oil in Afghanistan <laughs> or in the Middle East somewhere like that. Okay. Yeah. Self-critical. 
Well, there's ways to get rid of the anarthas. First of all, you have to recognize them. <laughs> Hmm. And the, the artha, anartha is there. There are anarthas. There's 16 anarthas, four categories of four. So learn what they are and avoid them. These are the anarthas. But the, the fast way, as Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains, the fast way to destroy anarthas is Harinam Sankirtan. Mm -hmm. Not just chanting japa, Harinam Sankirtan. So he says that that's the, he says Harinam Sankirtan crushes an artist quickly. So we should do more and more Sankirtan. <laughs> we do a lot here, and that's good, but there's never enough. <laughs> But learn the anarthas. There's anarthas by philosophical misconceptions, anarthas by pious activities, anarthas by impious activities, and anarthas by, by offenses. Four categories, and each of the categories has four categories, so there's 16 anarthas. Mm -hmm. That's mentioned by Bhakti Vino Thakur. And the demons of Vrindavan, Krishna killed the different demons. The different demons represent different anarthas. Like Putana, she represents the fake guru. <laughs> the, uh, the materialistic guru who comes to steal away the treasure of the, un the newborn by giving poisoning in them with, with false knowledge. <laughs> And that was the poison she had in her breast. She represents. So we have, you know, different demons represent different anarthas. Palambasura, he represented uh, wrong association with the opposite sex. Dainakasura represented uh, working hard for mat for material gain. That's all. <laughs> So there are different kinds of anarthas. Mm. If you want more information, you can read Bhakti Vinod Thakur's book, Chaitanya Shikshamrita. And in the very towards the end of the book, he describes the demons and what anarthas they represent. Or if you want, you, you can get a copy of my my. Uh, I just finished a lecture, a three-part lecture, for two hours each time on demons of Vrindavan destroying the Anartas. It's just been recorded. So if you want that, I did that on October 30th, November 6th, and November 13th, three, three Saturdays in a row for three times, just, just this year. So that's recorded, and if you contact the devotees in London, uh, the School of Bhakti, and they recorded all of that information, and you could probably get it from my website too. So that's, we, we went through the discussing the different anarthas and the different demons that represent different anarthas. No. But uh, we should be very, uh, if, if you practice tolerance and humility, which are the most outstanding qualities of a Vaishnava, then you gen generally can avoid making offenses or creating or acting on an artist. Mm -hmm. But then there's philosophical misconceptions that you have to learn. Philosophical misconceptions are four. One is not knowing who you are. In other words, think, if you think you're this body, if you think you're a woman or you think you're a Slovenian, that's an anartha. Or if you don't know Krishna's position, that's an anartha. 
If you don't know the process of bhakti, how to execute it, that's an anartha. And if you don't, if you mistakenly put material things in devotional service and think that they're spiritual, that's an anartha also. So these are the four philosophical misconceptions. The four anarthas by pious activities is wanting to enjoy sense gratification, material sense gratification. Two, wanting to be elevated to the heavenly planets to enjoy better material life. Three, uh, wanting to gain mystic power so you can become very powerful. And four, wanting to get liberation or impersonal liberation. And then in the four foreign artists for sinful activities is envy, uh, false de deceitfulness and fault finding. They go together, deceitfulness, fault finding, one, envy, two. Um, trying to enjoy things that are not allowed by the scriptures, just like breaking the four regulative principles. In other words, sinful activities for sense gratification. And the last one is pratishta, wanting to become famous by becoming a devotee. And then the last one, the four things that are mentioned by offenses, offenses against the deity, offenses against the holy name, offenses against the Vaishnavas, offenses against people in general, the non-devotees. So oh, these are the four, these are the 16 anartas, four categories of four. Mm -hmm. When Krishna swallowed the forest fire in Vrindavan, a forest fire just causes calamity. So when devotees fight amongst each other, that is called, uh, that is an anartha based on the forest fire like that, uh, when devotees fight like that amongst themselves. So Krishna is there in the form of swallowing up the forest fire. <laughs> okay, so these are, does that help? Hare Krishna. <laughs> Another question. Thank you, Maharaj, for this topic. I was uh, meditating on this uh, example of this father who claimed that I'm nonviolent, I'm nonviolent, and failed to actually protect his child. So that's violence when you fail to protect your dependents. Is that correct? Yeah. So. Yeah, by allowing violence to happen, you're being violent. If someone wants to do physical harm to you and you don't protect yourself you're just as guilty as the person who's trying to do physical harm to you just as guilty what about mental and emotional harm that's another form of violence so we have a duty to protect both ourselves as well as protect those who are dependent on us and protect religious principles and protect religious principles. But in today's a day and age, we see that those who are actually supposed to protect us, not only they do, do they not protect us, but they exploit and cheat and manipulate and abuse. Their Stay away from those guys. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> not everybody's like that. <laughs> Thank you. There's the bad guys and the good guys. <laughs> Find the good guys. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Srimad Bhagavad. Oh, you have a question. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, no, I'm glad that here you said about independent and this is uh, Krishna quality. And uh, we have the same, uh, this uh, 
little quality mat. We no, have I, it, but we don't have it like Krishna has it. We <laughs> have it in, a, in smaller proportion, that's all. This, this uh, helped me, yes, <laughs> because I always uh, inside why why I have so much wish to be independent. No, yeah, it's, it's natural. Yeah, and now I know that I have to be little, little. <laughs> but you have to use your independence in the right way. If you use it in the wrong way, then that'll work against you. Mm. So independence means to choose the right thing and then act on that like that. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Hare <laughs> Krishna. Okay, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Bhagavad Gita Jayanti ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai.